Rod Alfernis, who was the CTO of Bell Labs and has been the Dean of the College of Engineering for the last four years, and definitely the, um, the rocket propulsion behind one of these institutes um, give his view of what President, President Obama has initiated. So what I'm going to do is just give a little bit of an introduction to this national network of manufacturing institutes. The idea was expressed by President Obama in 2009. In 2012, he, he um, declared a, a, not just a vision, but a plan for how to execute on that, at least one model. And that model is the, a model of a national network of manufacturing institutes. Um, with the intent that ultimately there would be something like 15 of them, with the concept of helping to develop the ecosystem around advancing technologies, including elements of packaging and manufacture, and including automation in those, that would ultimately make sure or try to ensure that those technologies, those new products, could be evolved in a way that having invented the technology, developing the technology, we would also have an ecosystem of companies that were providing the capability to manufacture that technology and those products in a way that was cost effective in the US. President Obama actually made the announcement about the approach when he also launched the America Make, so that was the first of the institutes. Um, it's a, a 3D manufacturing um, technology. The second one, Power America, is basically about next generation um, power electronics manufacturing, basically power electronics for the grid, right? We all know that the, the, the electrical grid is aging and with photovoltaics and other technologies, it, the nature of it will be changing. Um, so it's really how do we build that infrastructure um, and the power industry and the power electronics that drives it in a way that we can, we can actually do that manufacturing in the U.S. in a cost-effective way. That institute, um, UCSB is participating in, Umesh Mishra, um, is uh, the key person driving the, the gallium nitride solution for highly efficient power electronics. Umesh is a member of the faculty of um, electrical and computer engineering at UCSB. And he has been a pioneer in the whole area of high-speed electronics and now in, in high-power, high-efficient electronics. Thank you, Rod. Uh, thank you all for coming. Power conversion is a kind of a hidden thing. It's not very sexy. You can't see it. <clears throat> it's basically all the power that is wasted in converting power from the way it arrives, 110 volts AC at the outlet, and it's converted into the form we need, um, either 12 volts for your PC or to charge your iPhone or whatever else. So power arrives in a certain form and is consumed in a completely different form. And in that, cons in that uh, transformation process, there's loss. And that loss is huge. So 10% of all the electrical energy generated in the US is lost in this conversion process. That's $40 billion worth annually. So this is a hidden tax you pay on electricity. So even though it's not really visible, it's obvious to the touch. If you have an old school dimmer in your home, you touch it, you'll see it's warm. A mechanical switch is not warm. And the reason the old school dimmer is warm is because when it converts power from one form to the other, it generates heat. That's the loss. So the way you f figure out loss is by touching something, not by seeing something. It's the heat. This institute targets system prototype demonstrations, models, breadboards, real things. And so what this institute is doing is pulling the university up the technology readiness level. Uh, and we're going there kicking and screaming because this is not something that we normally do. And we got to figure this out. It's okay. It's an experiment, as Leslie said. And we'll figure out how to do that. But 
what I'm saying is that this is not normal for a university to do. The nice thing about the University of California, Santa Barbara is we've had a history of entrepreneurship. So our faculty tend to look beyond the borders of academia. UCSB has been working on this. This didn't come about by accident, just like John has been doing this stuff forever. Uh, I mean, ever, I mean, he's a young man, so <laughs> not, not, not ever, ever, but fairly ever. And uh, we have been doing gallium nitride for a very long time, since 1994. We actually jumped on this bandwagon the minute we saw Nakamura's blue LED. We've gone through one successful spin-off, Nitrous, which was acquired by Cree in 2000, and now we've transformed. Uh, it is, the good thing is, the stuff we are making is being made into, is being sold. Okay, that's important. So it's being sold in India. India is now going through a massive solar expansion. They're going to go, they're going to put in over $100 billion in solar investment. And uh, because that's the quickest way in which they can generate energy and still meet climate change issues. I'd like to start off and initially just talk about why photonics matters to you and sort of what we're all going through as, as a society, and the transformation which is driving photonics. And uh, so, as it says here, it's, it's a big investment, it's $110 million, it's the largest IMI of, of, of all of them, and it's got a total of about $600 million worth of matching, so pretty significant commitments. In case you're not up on your acronyms, um, it goes kilo, mega, giga, tera, peta, exa, and zeta. So seven zeta bytes is seven, you know, 10 to the 21 bytes, or about 10 to the 22 bits. That, that's a lot of data that's being stored. So here's the data center. This is a Google data center. I think this one's in Oregon. It's big, right? It's like a football field sort of size. And if you look around the outside of this, these are all the cooling towers uh, that expel all the energy inside, right? So a big data center has, say, a million servers inside of it and you take a million servers, each running watts of power, you've got to expel all of that energy. So why are there optical fibers in a data center? So the fundamental reason is about fourfold. So it's a lot smaller, it's a lot more flexible, and it's actually a lot cheaper today. Fiber has 10,000 times less loss. It has a lot more capacity, about 10,000 times more capacity. And then finally is, in the end, these links typically take about 10 times less power. The American Institute for Manufacturing Integrated Photonics that has been set up by the Obama administration, administration and it's $110 million of funding uh, matched with about $500 million of state and industrial funding. And the goal here is to make, in particular, silicon photonics, but all photonics, uh, in the United States, and so develop that manufacturing technology uh, so that it's a strong industry and can lead towards uh, fiber to the home, data centers, supercomputers, and elsewhere. And we have tier one industries that are committing a you know, million dollars per year to this project. So, you know, again, Intel, IBM, Infinera is, a, is an indophosphide company, HP, and then a lot of the design companies like Cadence, Mentor Graphics, and Synopsys. Tier two are companies that are lower level of commitment, but again, companies like Lockheed Martin that want to use this in defense or TE and cables. Um, and then on the right, you can see the universities that are involved. So the three main universities are SUNY, UCSB, and MIT, and then Rochester Institute of Technology, University of Rochester, Davis, Arizona, and uh, Columbia are, are, are major uh, players as well. So to summarize, Silicon Photonic Integrated Circuits are here. Uh, they're being pursued by a number of companies like Intel, HP, Orion. It's a major focus of AIM, and our goal here is to improve all the manufacturing aspects of it. So higher yields, lower cost, better reliability. And, and the message for everyone here is that AIM is looking for industrial partners. So the whole goal is to transition this technology to enable you know, new fields and new products for large companies and small companies, and uh, we're looking to partner with, with companies across the United States. So what's listed here are a couple of uh, web addresses. You can check out more information on AIM or on the op electronics research going on at UCSB. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the wonderful talk. I'm a little bit curious about the university's position on sort of 
getting these innovations out, you know, as you're talking about to companies and industry, when you think about what strategic partners are looking for, it's sometimes um, something that's far enough along to take it and commercialize it. So that's this technology readiness level four. But also when you think about job drivers and having small companies take these technologies on and really develop them and commercialize them, that may be a great opportunity for job creation. So I'm, I'm curious, is, is the university looking to do partnerships with smaller companies and spin-offs, or are they really looking to just get this out to big industry that can immediately commercialize? I think the biggest focus is small and, and medium-sized businesses. So that, that's been the charter from Obama. You know, the, the belief, which I think is true, that most jobs are created in small businesses. So that's the highest uh, criteria for us. Um, so, and again, the goal is, this photonic design kit doesn't exist today, but within a year, it should be pretty good. That's, that's the intent. It will keep evolving over time. So any circuit designers out there that are familiar with you know, Cadence or Mentor, the intent is you can sit down and design your photonic integrated circuit in Cadence, and, and uh, you'll know exactly how it should perform, and, and it'll be fabricated with the cadence of this year, two multi-project runs, next year, three, year after that, four. So every quarter, there'll be a new design coming out that anyone can tap into. So there's, there's a price per square millimeter, just like there would be with Moses, and anyone can have a pick made. So to me, that's a huge advance. Any of the companies out here today that want to do photonics, you know, you're limited to what can you buy. I can buy a laser from this company, a detector from this company, but now you can actually do whatever integration you want to do a year from now. I have a very fundamental question. So thank you for your presentation, and um, very well done, and congratulations. And I absolutely believe this is the future. So how does, will this be able to be rolled out, and how will it evolve over time so we can solve the big problem, which is infrastructure that's falling apart? So I'll just put a, my own kind of quick view on I mean, it. For me, I, I would turn that around and, and, and say the good news is that while the grid is falling apart, the value proposition of upgrading it is now there, so it's not just rebuilding the same thing over again, right? So that doesn't solve the very short-term problem of a disaster, but at least gives financial justification for rebuilding that grid in a way that's modern, takes advantage of photovoltaics, takes advantage of more uh, energy-efficient technologies. So that will help make it happen in a way that would otherwise be un very difficult, I think. So Pedro Pizarro, the president of Southern California Edison, spoke here, what, about two weeks ago at UCSB campus, and he mentioned that there will be a major microgrid project, probably in Santa Barbara. So they, they are going to roll out some major, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of storage. So again, we're at the end of the line, uh, Southern California's line, and that's perhaps one of the reasons that that microgrid project will probably be done here first. And if you look at, uh, you take, say, um, I, uh, your point is very well taken, and some and two rods. Rod also addressed this. Just rebuilding more of the same is probably not a very good idea at all. And this gives us an opportunity to actually bring in much more distributed generation of all kinds. And in fact, if you go on the DOE website, and uh, so you know, so that you know, I'm not smoking crack. I mean, this is basically a. It's actually software developed by ABP. And they've run it that by 2035, if you're committed to it, 98% of the US energy can be renewable. Combination of all kinds of things, for example, wind in the right place, tidal in the right place, solar in the right place, and so on and so forth. And it's, um, so it's not insane to think that we can actually go down that path of going for more distributed generation. And so I totally believe it's an opportunity. Just building more of the same, I think, is a bad idea.